Good morning. Hope everybody's nice and stretched out from that previous exercise. Um, my name is David Kahn. I'm a first timer. Um, I'm also on the trustee. Um, I live in Ponte Vedra, Florida, which is right below Jacksonville. So, or another way, I'm about 20 minutes away from the Mayo campus in Jacksonville, um, where I get my treatment. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Stephen Ansel, who will be doing this session. Um, when I was first asked to do this, I thought I was going to be debating Dr. Ansel. But after watching earlier this morning, I realized very quick, quickly I'm not debating anything with any doctor today. But um, we're excited about this session. And while everybody has seen Dr. Ansel this morning, let me just introduce him formally. Um, he's a consultant in the Division of Hematology Department of Internal Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Ansel currently serves as chair of the Division of Hematology and is Enterprise Deputy Director at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. He joined the Mayo Clinic in 1999 and holds the academic rank of Professor of Medicine, Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. Dr. Ansel earned his MB CHB and PhD degrees at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where he also completed an internship in internal medicine and surgery, did a residency in internal medicine and fellowship in medical oncology, and Dr. Ansel continued his education at the University of, I am not going to pronounce this correctly, yeah, exactly what he said in Johannesburg, <laughs> where he was a registrar in internal medicine. He came to the United States and completed a residency in internal medicine and a fellowship in hematology and oncology at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Ansel's research focuses on investigating the phenotype and activity of the T cells and developing strategies to modulate the immune functions in lymph nomas. Now, I was told I only had two minutes to introduce myself, but Dr. Ansel, your, your accomplishments <laughs> took more than two minutes. But everybody, welcome Dr. Ansel. Well, thanks very much. So my goal today is really to build on uh, what Dr. Desar, I'm sure, has already introduced and some of the things that you might have heard. But I do remember that only about 10% of what you hear you remember. So I'm hoping you remember a different 10% from this talk from what you might have heard before. But what I am hoping that we'll do is I won't take all the time. I will just talk about some concepts and then I will shut up and give you a chance to come to the microphones and ask questions because I think it's valuable when you actually have answers that are more pertinent to the things that really you feel we need to address. Because what I've been asked to talk about is actually a very diverse kind of topic. And so I'm going to pick on a few things. I'm going to explain a few concepts. But most importantly, as I say, I would give you an opportunity to ask your questions. I also want to stress that some of the complications I'm going to talk about are uncommon. So again, what I'm going to hope to show is what are common effects versus some of the others. Because what I don't want you to think is that what some of these com complications you are destined to actually experience, because that would actually be untrue. Well, I'm going to need to just get on these slides. Let's try that. There we go. So I want to just take a few minutes to talk about why and how does Waldenstrom's cause complications. And what I want to talk about is the two parts of Waldenstrom's, the presence of a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma in your bone marrow, and a circulating monoclonal IgM protein in your blood. Those are the culprits. That's what's causing the problem. And then what kind of issues do those two things do? So they're really kind of three, if you like, principles. Too many cancer cells in your bone marrow or other organs crowd out good cells and cause issues. The actual IgM protein is super sticky and a big molecule. So it causes issues related to flow and basically trapping itself against vessel walls. And then finally, IgM is, is a monoclonal antibody, which job it is normally 
is to stick to stuff and activate the immune system. And obviously, if it sticks to the wrong stuff, you're going to get side effects, and that's where some of the side effects come from. So again, just to remind you, Waldenstrom's is really a disease with two problems. On the left, you can see the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. And that's why very commonly, you'll have a bone marrow test as part of, what your, uh, of your workup at the beginning. And what they're doing is they're looking to prove that there is actually an expansion of cells that are copies of each other. And you say, well, why lymphoplasmacytic? So just again to remind you where Waldenstrom's comes from, if you walk out of here, you breathe in pollen or some foreign protein, a virus, a bacteria, the way in which your body responds to that is cells that capture the protein go back to the lymph nodes and show the immune system this doesn't look right. The immune system reacts, and the way in which it reacts is by making antibodies. So lymphocytes are the cells that receive the, 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 the danger signal, and they turn into plasma cells that make the antibodies. As they do that, the first antibody they make is called an IgM antibody. It's a five-molecule big protein. It's kind of quick and dirty. It's the way to kind of get control fast. Not very specific, but super sticky. And it just grabs onto stuff and kind of plugs the, the dike, if you like. Meanwhile, back at the lymph node, training is happening. Intelligence is coming in. Additional information is being provided. And the immune system then takes the IgM and switches and starts to make an IgG. Think laser missile. This is one that's highly specific, knows exactly what it's going after, and will then take out whatever that danger to your system is. But you heard me say the word lymphocyte, and you heard me say the word plasma cell. A lymphoplasmacytic cell is the one that's in transition from the one to the other. And that's why it's making IgM. So when you get Waldenstrom's, you have a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate is where your cells got stuck. And they're making IgM the quick and dirty response, the big molecule that is super sticky. And that's what we'll talk about as far as side effects. So you're seeing the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate in your bone marrow, maybe in lymph nodes, maybe in your spleen. That's why you might have had a CAT scan. And on the other hand, the test in your blood, looking for the M spike or the monoclonal protein or the IgM level. Those are all kind of acronyms, if you like, for the same thing. And it's this big, and you can see a pentamer, five molecules kind of stuck together. This is just a little bit more information before we really get into the side effects. So here you can see a bone marrow slide, and you can see, to make it easy, the arrows pointing to the lymphoplasmacytic cells. Things that you can tell that make them those, the blueness of them. That's the monoclonal protein, the IgM inside them. And you can see their nucleus is off a bit to the side. And we test them genetically for that MYD88 and CXCO4 mutation. Here's the protein. Again, I told you it's the quick and dirty way in which the body reacts. That's why it's a five, kind of five heads. It actually has 10 heads because each one has two. It's going to grab onto things as quickly as possible, contain that bacteria or contain that virus. Super sticky, not very specific. That's why it sometimes sticks to the wrong stuff. Here's what I want us to just make sure we pause about right as we start. I'm going to talk about a lot of side effects. But not every one is common. Many are uncommon. So this is an old study now, 20 years old, 25 years old. But it looked at a lot of patients, all of whom had clearly symptomatic disease. IgM was over 3,000, at least 20% involvement of the bone marrow. So clearly active Waldenstrom's as we know it. So what did those people look like? What side effects did they have right off the bat? Important to notice, a quarter of them had none. So they just felt fine. They had just been detected on a test, and uh, then they went down this whole thing of testing, and uh, now they know they've got Waldenstrom's, and they went like, I'm sorry I went to see the doctor, because look what happened. <laughs> um, but some people will notice that that's how their story started. Those are the people we watch closely, 
but those are not necessarily the people who need treatment. And despite a lot of questions asked in the study, they could not really identify any symptoms. Really important not to treat those people, just by the way, because many of them can take a long time before they actually get symptoms. The most common thing, though, was anemia. Red cells were lower than they needed to be. That was almost 40% of people. A number of people had hyperviscosity. So you remember I said this protein is big. It doesn't allow the blood to flow quite right. It kind of makes your blood a little bit like uh, syrup, if you like. And it's super sticky. So this viscosity issue caused them problems. And we'll talk more about that. People had also what they call constitutional symptoms. They just didn't feel right. And the main things they didn't notice, what they noticed was they were losing weight. And this wasn't just a pound or two. This is 10% of their body weight. They had just like pounds of peeling off here for no good reason. They had drenching, particularly night sweats. So much so that they had to get up and take their pajamas and change the bedding. And their spouse said, you are disgusting because there's a puddle where you were, you know, that degree of sweating. Not just I felt a little hot. And then they had fevers, 101.5 or higher. No good reason. So you might ask yourself, why does that happen? So remember I told you the normal way in which the immune system reacts. Sees a protein, virus, pollen, bacteria, that's a threat. Reacts by making these antibodies I spoke about. But think back to when you were a kid and you really got a bad infection. And you had a really bad fever and shaking chills and your mom said you spoke all kinds of rubbish because you were kind of confused and all the rest of it. That's because those immune cells were in hyperdrive. And when they were like that activated, they make these proteins called cytokines. And that's what gives you these symptoms. Fevers. And if it keeps going, you start to lose weight. You get these drenching sweats. So these are not, you don't have an infection. It's like your body, these cancer cells are behaving like you do. And that's what we call constitutional symptoms. I'm going to talk in a minute about bleeding. So one of the things that's very interesting, sometimes Waldenstrom's patients will brush their teeth and go, holy smoke, I just about you know, bled out into the basin here with how much my, my gums bled. And so bleeding, especially when your protein gets very high, has to do with the fact that that abnormal protein is interfering with your clotting. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then neurological symptoms. You know, spouse said, she's not, or he's not as bright as I used to be. You know, just like the lights went out here for a minute. Um, and part of it is poor amount of perfusion, the way in which blood is delivered to your brain. And that's, again, because the blood is super thick, and we'll talk about that in a second. But what I do want to stress is a lot of the other side effects that I'm going to talk about were not even listed here. They were uncommon. So just because you hear me talk about it doesn't mean everybody gets it. So now I want to break up what we're going to talk about into sort of these different categories that I mentioned. This is now about the lymphoplasmacytic cells in the tissue. Direct infiltration. That causes one set of side effects. So the first thing to say is bone marrow infiltration. This is why they do the bone marrow test. And here you can see on the right the brown stuff. That's staining for cancer cells. And what we're doing now is we're looking to see if those cells are copies of each other. Because when you get a cancer, by its nature, by the definition, every cell is an identical copy of the previous one. So that's the problem. You're supposed to have B cells, B lymphocytes, but you're not supposed to have ones that are identical copies. of. And you can have a few when you have an infection, but you shouldn't have a lot. So you can tell that every single one of these stains brown meaning those are all copies of each other. And over time, some of you would know, and Dr. Mattis in the case that he presented, 70%, 80%, sometimes even 100% of the bone marrow can end up being these lymphoplasmacytic cells that are copies of each other. Why does that matter? Well, there's no room for good cells. And remember, it's not just your bone marrow. You can get infiltration into lymph nodes. You can get infiltration into the spleen. And you might say, well, why would that happen? Well, just remember, the natural behavior of a lymphocyte is it's born in your bone marrow, travels to your lymph nodes, that's where it kind of hangs out, and then it can go any body, any tissue in your body. So we're looking at the bone marrow, where it kind of got born, 
We're looking at the lymph nodes, where it likes to hang out. That's what scans are about. And a spleen is, in essence, a really big lymph node. Kind of does the same thing. But if you have a lot of these cells infiltrating, you're either going to get big lymph nodes, big spleen, or a decrease in your blood counts, particularly your hemoglobin. And why is that? No room for the cells that make hemoglobin or make red cells. And also poisoning of that whole process through a protein called hepcidin. So those of you that have had low blood counts, you got started on a brutinib. One of the things a brutinib or BTK inhibitors will do very quickly will reverse that process and people's hemoglobins come up quite quickly. And that's because this poisonous protein called hepcidin that turns off the production of uh, red cells, that is immediately reversed. So that's number one complication. Number two complication is you're going to have one set of proteins go up, the IgM, but often you can get the other proteins go down. So you actually, and also as you get treatment over time, that's very common. They call it hypogamma globulinemia. That's just a fancy name. Hypo means low. Gamma globulinemia means big protein. So they're low big proteins. And in essence, that's when IgG, IgA, and other kind of body's defenses can go low. Shown here is how this is important kind of around your body, because as I mentioned to you, these are your body's natural defenses. So it can infiltrate into the bone marrow, causing the red cells to go down, it can infiltrate into the bone marrow and other places, causing your immune system to malfunction. And furthermore, it can infiltrate into other tissue. And I show you here information where it can get into the brain or into the CSF, or the spinal column. And this is called Bing-Neal syndrome. Now, some of you will have heard about it, but I want to again stress this is not very common. And why is this an issue? This is what they call a sanctuary site. So when lymphocytes get there, the immune system sometimes struggles a little bit to get at them, but more importantly, chemicals struggle to get there. And what I mean by that? is that drugs, typical chemotherapy drugs, your brain does not want the chemotherapy circulating around the brain. So the lining around the brain, called the blood-brain barrier, keeps that stuff out. So then the treatment may work in your body, but doesn't work in your brain. That's the reason you have to pick drugs that can really penetrate and get there to actually work well. Good news, though, from the debate you just heard, both the family of BTK inhibitors and bendamustine plus rituximab do that. They can actually penetrate in. So again, for most people, one of those two combinations is the standard thing we would go to. But what you can see in this picture is when you're looking at an MRI scan, which these are, white is bad. So the more white you have, not good. And you can see the top panel, A, there are some areas where clearly there's a whole bunch of white, and that's not a good thing. Panel B, you can see this kind of speckled appearance, can look a little different, and then you can see a longitudinal section of the base of somebody's spine, and clearly there's a lot of white stuff going on there, not a good thing at all. So those were the problems from infiltration, the cells being in the wrong place. Now I'm going to talk about side effects that come from the circulating IgM. So this is, again, remember this is a problem with two, disease with two problems. This circulating IgM, what can that cause as far as complications? So the first thing is hyperviscosity. So remember I said it's a big protein. Remember I said it's super sticky. But you can imagine if you're loading your protein up with thousands of grams per deciliter of a big protein, that's making your blood now travel much slower than normal. So as it does, it doesn't deliver oxygen very well. And then you can get all the problems that you can see in these pictures. So you're seeing at the top right, top left, ulcers on people's feet. That actually is called a watershed area because two sets of blood vessels kind of overlap. But if neither of them are delivering very well, then the gap in the middle is actually a little bit ischemic, meaning not enough oxygen being delivered. That's when you can get ulcers and breakdown. You can see the person at the bottom has Raynaud's phenomenon. So basically not enough oxygen being delivered to the fingers, Often happens if you're in cold weather and the like, suddenly the fingers go super white. You can see that right there. Now you can see in the middle a different issue in somebody's brain. This is now not cells that are there. This is now not good delivery of oxygen because of thick blood. And when you do that, remember I said white is bad, 
Brain cells are in trouble, and so when they do that, you get this white that you can see right here. And finally, you can see in the eyeball, and that's why many of you will have had retinal tests, and they'll look at the back, you can actually get bleeding that happens in the back of the eye. Also, you can actually get what we call sausaging, where you sort of see blobs of goop kind of going through the blood vessels in the back of the eye. All of that causes you to have trouble with your vision, obviously trouble with your thinking, and then trouble with ulceration and other things. So that's the one problem, purely just the blood is too thick. Now the problem is, remember, this IgM is unnatural, and so it can have some characteristics of its own that aren't good. And one of them is it doesn't like cold, so it precipitates. And so you can see here, just as a simple test, if you just take somebody's blood, spin out the red cells so it doesn't clot, or the platelets, put it over there and just let it stand at room temperature, you'll basically see that there's a cryoprecipitate, which you can see, and this is what's called cryoglobulinemia. And that precipitate is really irritating to the, immune, to the body in general and can cause clotting and little kind of inflammatory changes in many of the small blood vessels. You can then get, get what is known as cryoglobulinemia, and that ends up being problems with circulation through your hands and feet, very similar to this next circumstance that I'm going to talk about, and that's cold agglutinin disease. Same kind of principle. But now it's not that that, that uh, precipitating protein it just irritates the blood vessels. It actually sticks to stuff, particularly sticks to other red cells. And when it does that, people get what's called hemolysis. You break down your own red cells, and they get very anemic because they're basically destroying their own cells. That's what's shown in the, on the panel C. Your red cells are supposed to be these nice round little discs. You can see all these banana-shaped looking cells, and that's because they're being chomped up by the spleen, which is part of your quality control, because as these cells come by, it goes, that one doesn't look right. It's got all the stuff stuck to it, and just chomps off bits of it. And when it does that, the cells end up in really funny shapes. So again, what I'm hoping you're hearing, blood kind of gets thick, not enough oxygen being delivered. The actual protein is a problem as far as its structure is concerned, very sticky, but also easily precipitates, irritates the tissue, sticks to red cells. Now you heard me say earlier, also a problem with bleeding. So here is what is called acquired von Willebrandt's disease. So again, big name, don't expect you to remember this. But interestingly, when you have problems with bleeding, you've got to remember your immune system has two parts to it. Or your clotting system has two parts to it. It has the plugs, the platelets, that's what sticks in the holes. But the moment that happens, there is a protein cascade that happens which causes little tethers to kind of tether the platelets. It's like cables, if you like. And the red, the, the, those little platelets get stuck down. And that whole cabling process is done with von Willebrand's factor, which is a protein that connects the cables to the actual plugs. So if you can't connect the cables and the plugs, the plugs start to break apart. And when that happens, you start to get nosebleeds, you get easy gum beating, you get all this bruising in your tissue. And the reason that the two don't stick to, don't, don't connect with each other, is because the IgM interferes with the von Willebrand factor. Again, it sounds kind of complicated, but all I want you to hear at the end of the day is this big protein is not just floating around doing nothing. It does a lot of sticking to stuff, and much of that is not favorable to you. The further thing is peripheral neuropathy. So it's all still in the principle of it's sticking to the wrong stuff. So remember, its job, an IgM protein, is to be the quick and dirty reactor, sticks to danger signals. The problem is if it sticks to not danger things, you, that's not a good situation at all. So what happens when you often get peripheral neuropathy, it sticks to the little cells that form the sheath on the outside of, of, uh, nerves, of, nerve, of nerves. Those cells are a little bit like the, um, if you think about a wire and it's got that plastic coating on the outside, it's like the plastic coating on the outside. But if you go stripping that plastic coating off and then put a whole bunch of wires together, you're going to get a short circuit. So that's what's happening in your body. The antibody sticks to that myelin sheath on the outside. Macrophages that are the trash collectors of your body come and go, that's not right, chomp it off. But when they chomp it off, they leave the wire exposed. And then they chomp off the one right next to it, 
and then the wires touch, and ooh, you suddenly get a surprisingly unpleasant <laughs> feeling because the nerve is now misfiring and malconducting. And what you're seeing here is you can see how that person's foot is really kind of arched up like that, and that's because the nerves are now malfunctioning and not giving the right messages to the muscles, and the muscles are malaligned on that foot. And you can see on the right, that's an EMG, which is really just a check the wiring, and we're looking to see if we can see those short circuits I mentioned. Two more things just to say about places where things get deposited. So you might have heard already about systemic amyloidosis. So what this is, that big protein can break down into pieces of the protein. And those pieces of the protein can then get deposited in different tissues. So you can see somebody here who has what they call macroglossia, big tongue. And you can see actually he or she, when they bite, they actually now leave little indents because there's not actually enough room in the mouth for the person's big tongue. That in of itself is annoying but not dangerous, but it's a way to tell that that's what's going on. <clears throat> what you're seeing on the top is people that have very easy bruising and very commonly bruising around their eyes, the so-called raccoon eyes, which you can see. And then you can see at the bottom is where we're looking for this protein that's being deposited in the tissue. And that's that kind of greeny colored stuff, yellow green stuff. And what that really does mean is that if that's in organs like your kidneys or your heart or your bowel, that can really give you substantial risks and problems because cells do not appreciate things that are in between that are kind of pushing them apart. They tend to malfunction. Your heart pump function, your wiring in your heart can go out of kilter. You can have problems with your kidneys, kidney failure, and the like. So all of those can be substantial risks. And then you can actually get deposits in the skin. This can be called Schnitzler's syndrome. And all you're seeing here is this kind of little, if you feel it, almost a textured kind of nature where these cells or these proteins are present in the skin. Now, again, I want to stress this is not a very common side effect. So if you say, I haven't had that, well, that's actually a really good thing. So that's just a whirlwind, and I'm sorry if I seem to be talking about a lot of different things, but that's why we want to have some time for questions and discussion to talk about things you might care about more. But what are the principles of how you manage those issues? Well, in essence, there are really three. The first is the most important. If you do not switch off the cells that are making the problem, the problem will not go away. Everything after that is a Band-Aid. So in essence, what you want to do is you want to give a treatment that kills the cancer cell. Because if the cancer cell is dying, or at least it's being held in check, it's not causing any of the infiltration problems, and the protein is not being made, so the protein is not causing any of the stickiness problems. That's really the strategy. And you heard and you will hear more at this meeting about lots of different therapies. Then sometimes the damage is either done or it's hard to control the disease so the, the symptoms are going to be around for a while. So one of the things that's really important is just to say, um, if you've had neuropathy to date, for example, that doesn't easily get fixed. It takes a while. And if sometimes, it never goes back to normal. So then you have to take the second strategy, which is how can we just control the symptoms? So now you're working in parallel with point number one, and that is you're developing strategies that will help with the symptoms. But just to stress, this is not fixing the underlying problem. This is just making that problem more tolerable. And finally, sometimes if you're in a pinch, you can just skim off that big protein. Think of an oil change. You basically take your car in. They drain out some really black-looking, nasty oil. They put in some nice, good-looking oil. And in essence, that's all we're doing. We drain out all that protein and we put back some fresh uh, serum and pretty much just do an oil change. But just like an oil change and you're back in three months, this whole plasmapheresis is purely a cosmetic thing that we would do for a period of time. It would not be durable. You've got to go after the cancer cell as the source. So just to say a few words about that, when you get really high protein levels and you get hyperviscosity, people can't see well, they can't think straight, they have a lot of those bleeding problems. Just again to point out, hyperviscosity not common if your protein is under four grams. 
So if you've got a number of two point something grams and somebody says you're hyperviscous, you might say there might be something else going on. Because let me pause for a second and say, one of the challenges with some of these complications and symptoms I'm talking about is other things can do it too. So I will tell you in my practice, I see a lot of people who have a very low, really an IgM MGUS with some neuropathy. And yes, that could be due to the protein from the, uh, the monoclonal protein, but it could also be from their diabetes. It could also be from other things. And dissecting and working out what is what is actually really key. Here, just to show you how effective this can be. So this is something you can see these arrows are pointing at a variety of different things. High protein makes the optic disc, that's where the optic nerve comes in, swell up. That's not good. You can get the sausaging that I spoke to, which is actually this blood vessels are kind of stretched out. And then you can very easily get some leaking and bleeding. All of that before the plasmapheresis. Then you have the oil change, and you can see that it's substantially better. But if you do nothing else, given a few months, you'll be right back where you left off. So with that, I'd thank you for your time and attention. That's a whirlwind through side effects, but what I'd like to do, I think we have about 15 minutes remaining, and I wanted to make sure that if you have questions, I do my best to answer them. So I'm gonna invite people to use those two mic three microphones right there, and I think um, more microphones may be coming, I don't know. Moving them up to the front so we can get at it a little bit easier. But I really would encourage you to ask any questions that you might have. So, Doctor, thank you very much. Um, there are a couple from online that I'll kick this off. So here's a question. Do WM patients have a higher risk in suffering a heart attack? Yeah, good question. And I would say, to the best of my knowledge, not a higher risk. Not that I'm familiar with. There are many reasons you'd have a heart attack. Many of them have to do with other issues, your cholesterol, your blood pressure, family risk factors, and the like. And as you know, Waldenstrom's is not a very common disease. So to really identify a higher risk across a large population, that's actually quite hard. Ways in which possibly there could be greater risk is if you really have very high protein levels and you're not delivering blood, um, uh, delivering blood and, and oxygen to your heart muscle, you could very easily have symptoms and uh, potentially run a risk of a heart attack. However, I think to be fair to the question, I don't think that that is actually demonstrably true. You didn't mention mouth ulcers, mouth sores, I wonder why. Well, so again, the reason I didn't mention mouth sores is that um, there are many reasons you can get mouth sores. And the question always, and this is you heard me say earlier, is do you know for a fact it's due to the disease, which is what I focused my conversation on, but equally easily could be due to complicating factors of the disease and complicating factors of the disease therapy. So treatment, very notorious for giving you mouth ulcers. Having a compromised immune system, very notorious for giving you mouth ulcers. But strictly speaking, not directly due to the actual disease itself. So not saying that those aren't symptoms associated with the circumstances of Waldenstrom's, but actually, to the best of my knowledge, not directly caused by it. Uh, how long do you go on treating symptoms before you go to treat the Waldenstrom's? Um, so again, that's a very good question, and it depends on which symptom we're talking about. The main thing for me is, if you really believe that the symptoms are associated directly with the Waldenstrom's, you need to treat the Waldenstrom's. Because if you just kind of keep treating the symptoms, you are actually never going to fix the problem and probably you're going to be chasing your tail because your symptoms are going to get worse. So bottom line is you need to firstly, as I was saying to the previous question, be sure you know that what you're treating is directly related to the Waldenstrom's. And if you believe that, then you need to treat it. So for example, the neuropathy issue, you could have what appears to be a pretty modest amount of Waldenstrom's that in and of itself might not need treatment. But if you have a very bad neuropathy as problem associated with that, you would do very well to treat it because if you treat it, you'll at least prevent additional injury. Otherwise, if you just kind of ignore it over time, you could get more problems. 
Well, this is kind of a follow-up question for that, and maybe more appropriate to the workshop on neuropathy tomorrow. But uh, what do you recommend uh, for treating the symptoms of neuropathy as opposed to treating the Waldenstrom's, uh, uh, the underlying disease that may be causing the neuropathy? What would you recommend for symptom control? Well, again, not wanting to steal all the thunder from last, uh, from next uh, session tomorrow, I'll just say in broad principles, there are a lot of tools that can be used. And these are medications predominantly, but also some physical methods that can really make a difference. And I think this is one of the things in my practice where I really engage with the neurology team because there are new things coming along all the time. But I would encourage you then to attend the uh, workshop on neuropathy rather than get into that. That's a good question, but I think let's hold it for then. Good morning, Dr. Ansel, and thank you for that presentation. I have amyloidosis, and I was treated with BR um, because of that. I didn't really have any other symptoms. And I was just wondering, how diligent do you need to be in the follow-up to see if the amyloid is actually going to go into the heart, kidneys, or some other organ? Yeah, so a good question. <clears throat> one of the things that's a little bit challenging and something that one needs to be aware of for, for amyloidosis is the deposition or the depositing of that protein in tissue takes a long time to go away. So the, the plan for treatment initially is to stop more of it being put down to prevent further complications, but you have to rely on your body's trash collectors over time to slowly move the debris out of there. And sometimes they don't do that quickly and sometimes they probably don't do it ever. And what I mean by that is if you, for example, have enlarged lymph nodes secondary to amyloidosis and you give bendamustine plus rituximab, you could get a very nice response in every other parameter that we measure and your lymph nodes could remain exactly the same size. And part of it is you're not getting rid of what's there, you're just stopping more. So to your question, how do you track things and know whether it's working or not? The way we do that is to track the damage that it's done to make sure that doesn't get worse, number one, and hopefully gets better, number two. And that's, we'll check an echocardiogram where we look at the pump function of your heart, basically showing that your pump function stays good and hopefully improves. Similarly, we'll do tests on your kidneys to make sure your kidney function is good, to make sure that that doesn't get worse and show any evidence of deterioration. It can affect your nerves. We'll do nerve function tests. So it's all about how your organ is working, not necessarily how it looks. If we're in a pinch, sometimes we'll do another biopsy and take another look. The problem with that is just it depends on sampling. If you stuck it where there was a lot of something and then it looks bad and you stick it on another side, it's a little bit better. I don't really know that that's better. So it's all about how it works. Okay. Um. We have an online question that actually came up a couple times, so I thought I'd ask. Um, doctors have said to take baby aspirin. That will help with the prevent uh, velocity. Um, velocity. Hyperviscosity? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, is, is that a good treatment plan? Um, so again, I would just be cautious that whoever is asking that question clearly understands why one is giving baby aspirin. So baby aspirin, remember, so how does that work? What a baby aspirin does is it stops platelets, remember the plugs, from sticking to each other and sticking to things. So that's really good when you're trying to stop heart attacks and other things that come from blood clots. But if you have hyperviscosity, remember the reason you're not getting good delivery of, of blood somewhere has nothing to do with your platelets. It's not like there's any clotting or anything going on. It's that you've got thick blood. So you've got to be careful to think that a, an antiplatelet agent is going to fix the thick blood issue. And also important just to know, remember I showed you Van Willebrand's disease, where everybody went, oh, that's a big name, I've forgotten it already. But that protein interaction is actually affected in a rare number of patients. If you have a Van Willebrand's problem and it was easy bleeding and you take a platelet agent like aspirin, you now got a double whammy. The platelets, they couldn't remember, they couldn't tether it down with the, with the fibers, with the, with the cables, if you like, and now you're mucking with the plugs so that they're not sticky anymore. So now you actually may make your bleeding problem 
even worse. So I might check with the doctor to say, let me understand exactly why, because the doctor may have other reasons why, which may be quite legitimate, just make sure that that's, that's straight. So as a follow-up to the amyloid question earlier, um, my understanding is that the culprit in uh, light chain amyloidosis is not normal circulating free light chain, which is quite soluble, but in fact is denatured abnormal light chain. Um, have you got a means of monitoring what I'll say is the high risk light chain uh, before you have to wait for organ failure? Yeah, very good question. Um, so you heard me try and simplify, because you're asking a very sophisticated question here, you heard me try and simplify it down to talk about sort of degraded and broken down, if you like, uh, immunoglobulin. So you're right. It's a portion of the, of the immunoglobulin, and it's abnormal. So that's why it's doing what it is, the problem, causing the problems it is. So to your question, obviously if you track the total free light chain fraction, that's the amount in general, even if you track everything, not just the bad and the good, if it's all going down, that's a better sign, that's a good sign. So quite frankly, because of available tests, that's usually what's tracked. But we will also do what's called mass spectrometry, where we actually are looking at the structure of the proteins to determine exactly what kind of amyloid you have. But as you probably know, because it sounds like you're pretty sophisticated in the space, that's not very quantitative. It's actually quite difficult to know how much. So you can say how, what it looks like, the structure of it, and exactly what proteins are causing it, but what we don't always then do is use that test to track it. We use the free light chain assay as a more global approach to kind of track that it's improving. When you've uh, been on a medicine, like I've written it for quite a few years, have you found that some people develop a digestive issue, like IBS or acid reflux a little bit more? Is that something else that's kind of a side effect of things? Yeah, so in general, as you pointed out, a lot of people tolerate BCK inhibitors and other chemotherapies quite well. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that we've learned, some of which was not expected, is that BTK is actually present in more cells than we thought it was. We thought it was a B cell only thing, but like one of the problems with irregular heartbeats and one of the problems with, um, with easy bruising and bleeding is that BTK is in other places. And you can get BTK expression in some of the cells that line your intestinal tract. And so, yep, you can certainly get side effects and potential complications. And if you look at that list that I showed, even though many of them are grade one and two, mm -hmm. which was what you have, in other words, irritating, but you're not stopping the drug because of it, right. you know, you'll see gastrointestinal symptoms and other things present. So yes, that's true. That's where some tweaking ways of maybe decreasing the dose if you need to, oh. using other agents with it as a way to help with the symptoms, and just being sure that you really are treating something that's due to the drug, not something else. So many times they'll take a look in your stomach just to make sure there's nothing else going on. Yeah, and so, I mean, there's treatments for it and you just live with it. <laughs> well, like that's true. And the, the whole thing is, you see, um, it's a weighing up of risks versus benefits. Right. The benefit you get from a brutinib or BTK inhibitors in general versus the risk that you have, obviously, from the Waldenstrom's getting active again. And we, we kind of have to weigh the balances. Thank you. I don't believe you mentioned fatigue, and that is something uh, that, with my acquaintance with other WMers, is a fairly common uh, issue. And I've had, had uh, WM for a long time, and I still have fatigue. My, my uh, IgM is way down, and so on now with the abrutinum stuff, but what, what, do you, what do you say about fatigue? What, That's a what good question. So I avoided that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's why, I'll be quite honest. So you just told me something that's very interesting. You had fatigue when you were diagnosed. Yes. You got started on abrutinib, you had a nice response to abrutinib, and you still have fatigue. Yes. So the question is, is the fatigue directly related to the Waldenstrom's? And the answer is complicated. Because your disease burden, the number of cells and the amount of protein, that's way down. But your fatigue symptom is not. 
So those are not directly correlated. There are other factors that play into the whole picture. So when you're talking about things that Waldenstrom's does specifically, it certainly causes fatigue. However, many people can have fatigue and Waldenstrom's, and Waldenstrom's is not causing the fatigue. Mm. The most common thing in my practice is poor sleep. Sleep apnea, other issues like that. They don't sleep well at night, so they're tired in the day, and their doctor says it's their Waldenstrom's. And they go on a CPAP machine and the fatigue goes away entirely, and they got treated for Waldenstrom's for no good reason. So the reason I avoided it is not because it isn't associated, but because it's very difficult to make those correlations sometimes. My sleep apnea machine did help. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Don't know the man, so it's lucky. <clears throat> now, I'm talking about the sticky blood. When I found out about that, I added fish oil to the diet. Is that a good thing to help, or, or certainly yeah. for the population in this room? Yeah, so just, so again, one would be very careful when you say, well, oils are pretty slippery, so, you know, must be helping my blood, right? Because <laughs> everything now becomes super slippery. Well, no, not exactly true. So remember, your body is very careful about what it wants inside of it and only absorbs some stuff and not others. And when it absorbs it, it breaks it down into sort of components of it. So you don't really have fish oil floating around in your blood, just to say. But why is that important? Remember, thick blood might be a problem. Very high triglycerides and other things might actually make your blood a little thicker rather than thinner. And so one of the challenges always is discussing your supplements and other things with your, your medical team. Because interestingly, not even so much that supplements are sometimes a little risky for the effects they directly cause, they actually are sometimes quite risky for the effects they have on medications. So a brutinib, for example, has quite a lot of interactions with some things that people commonly take as supplements. So just again, making sure your medical team knows everything that you're taking, including your supplements. And so sometimes, you know, fish oil can be good for you. Omega-3s and whatever are generally antioxidants and quite helpful. But if you're on certain medications versus others, you just want your team to know that. They do. Excellent. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, knowing that uh, Wallace Rob is a blood disease, can CAT scans or MRIs pick up any evidence of some possibilities of uh, reoccurrence and things like that? Yeah, very good question. So, so just remember, different tests are done for different reasons. So the bone marrow test is done to look at what's happening in the bone marrow. You don't have another good way really to test that. Blood tests are done to work out how high the protein is. You don't really have another good way to test that. CAT scans are done to work out, is there deposits of the cells in lymph nodes and spleen? Because there's not another way to test that. So if you have no enlarged lymph nodes and get started on treatment, you don't really need a repeat CAT scan because that's not something we're tracking. But if you do, that's a very important test because that's something we're tracking. Similarly, you know, blood work is routine because most people have an elevated IgM. There are other kinds of diseases that are very similar but aren't Waldenstrom's where that's never the case, in which case you wouldn't test for an IgM protein because it's not elevated. So it's all about tracking what you need to know. Hi, I'm from British Columbia, Canada, and I'm saying that because I'm uh, thinking of two men in my support group that deal with the doesn't like the cold, um, and they are on Zan and, you know, treating the WM, but it's not really um, helping that other, the other issues of the, I'll let you say the two things. Cryoglobulinemia, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And um, what, what can help with that specifically as they're, you know, taking the Zan, but it's not really as effective as they would like it to be because it's Well, very... there's an easy answer. Move to Arizona. Yes. <laughs> and, and that's what... not actually facetious because here's why. Most of the time, xanabrutinib, obrutinib, bendamustine, rituximab will substantially improve the disease, bring the protein level down very low. However, in those circumstances, the smallest amount of that protein that's still super sticky and sticking to the wrong stuff 
will keep sticking to the wrong stuff. And many of those symptoms will, particularly like the hemolysis or the breakdown of red cells, is actually very difficult. You can have an IgM protein of like 500, which is kind of good, and still have substantial hemolysis when you're in the cold. So that actually is, the best thing they could do is bundle up or move. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ansel. Um, I have a symptom, I have some of the symptoms when my disease increases that you mentioned, anemia, um, fatigue, sweating, but I also have coughing, and that cough gets worse and worse with increase of um, my IgM, and then when I get treated, um, it stops. So when I got treated the second time five years ago with, uh, started on Iprotinib, the next day it stopped. But the symptom is so strong that there is a constant coughing to the point of choking up and I can't go to the theater anymore, I just can't stop it. But nobody ever mentions coughing except I've met patients in these groups that mentioned they had the same symptom. Yeah, so good question. That's a little harder to know. So in and of itself, just simply having a cough, that isn't a very common side effect. But you did show, see me show the infiltration of protein in the skin, Schnitzler mm -hmm. syndrome. You can get the same infiltration in the bronchial lining, mm -hmm. which would obviously be super irritating to the bronchial lining and cause a cough all the time. The only way we would know if that was in, true, in fact true in your case would be to actually do a bronchoscopy when we put a camera mm -hmm. down and take a biopsy. Mm -hmm. So I would say no one probably has done that, but if you really, really, really wanted to know at a time when the cough was at its worst before they restarted treatment, you could do that to test. Thank you. Last question. Oh my gosh, I, both of those questions. So one, I have oh, sorry, a cough two too. More. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, Is go ahead. Me? I have a cough too, by the way, and that's, it goes away with treatment. But I'm um, going back to the, you said about, um, I have Raynaud syndrome, same thing. I live in Florida, and it still acts up in Florida. It just depends on what I'm doing. If I'm sitting in my house and the air condition's on, it would come back out. But And I've had lower IgM, too, even with it. Yeah, so very important to say there are different reasons to have fingers that go white. And Raynaud's is basically a delivery of oxygen due to the blood being thick, not necessarily because of the protein sticking and depositing. Well, that's much more common with cryoglobulinemia and uh, cold agglutinin disease. So yeah, you can have those kinds of symptoms and you can be in Florida and that can still happen. Cold still does to rain out phenomenon, maybe makes it worse, and if you say the air con kicks in, you suddenly go, gosh, that's now making my hands hurt or my nose just went kind of blue. Um, but you know, turn up the air con is the bottom line. <laughs> or go outside, yep. You, you mentioned Bing Neal earlier in your discussion and it's a concerning and uh, complication for uh, Waldenstrom's. <laughs> is there any new or recent data uh, regarding the effectiveness of the treatment of the BTK inhibitor or the B uh, bendamustin rituxan? Yes, yeah, a good question, and there have been a few studies done specifically with a brutinib and specifically with bendamustine and rituximab, which have shown that that actually is both of them very effective for Bing Neal syndrome, and that's usually the routine that we would go to. Less data around xanabrutinib, but certainly a lot of anecdotal benefits, so I would assume it's probably have similar results to abrutinib, but we just don't know that from a study specifically. So all told, many of the effective therapies you heard about work for Bing Neal as well. All right, thanks everybody.